let's uh, hear Jen. Um, I love that you, your quote that you are passionate about transformation, mm -hmm. diving below the surface and exploration of truth teachings, discovering wisdom and life's lessons and joy along the journey. I th th that song does says that very thing. I think that's wonderful. Um, Jen is uh, a contributing author to the Unity publication Worthy, uh, a booklet offering spiritual support for 14 writers who overcame years of rejection to see themselves as dynamic expressions of God. In addition to visiting and speaking at multiple Unity churches, Jen works full-time in communication, production, and digital media at Unity Worldwide. Uh, and so uh, we welcome Reverend Jen Dickey. Take it away. Thank you so much. It is my absolute joy to be with your community this morning. So you would think with a title like Knock Knock Who's There, I would start out with a joke. And I hate to tell you, I don't have a joke for you this, this morning, but I do want to share a little bit of a sketch from one of my favorite comedians, who's Seb Sebastian Maniscalco. And he has this sketch, if you're familiar with him, he talks about the difference between answering the door back in the day, back in our day, to answering the door now. So he says, you know, sometimes he said, he said back in the day, people would come in and the doorbell would ring. There'd be a knock on the door and you, you would see the kids come running across the, the room, sliding in their socks to I'll get it, I'll get it, come and, and answer the door. And you throw open the door and it's like, oh my gosh, just, just it's company. We have company over and they're invited on in to come and have some, you know, have some food, have some drinks, stay as long as you want. Just very, oh, we're just so delighted that you came and knocked on our door and, and we have company. Nowadays, <laughs> somebody comes and knocks on your door and rings your doorbell. You pretend that you are not home. <laughs> you shut off the lights. You tell everybody to army crawl across the floor. You're closing the blinds like nobody's here. Nobody is here at all. <laughs> and I love that sketch because it's it, it is sad. And yet it, it is true that there is such a different reaction that we can have then versus now. And so this morning, I want to talk about understanding what we can do with our life experiences, what we can do with these knocks and these opportunities that come to our door. Because life is a continuous process of learning and evolving. I love spending time with children. I, I don't have any, but I love spending time with children when they are awakening and becoming alive to the world and to all that is out there. Because they're born with the same thing we had too, that we have, um, some of us have outgrown, but some of us continue to have this, this uh, experience of evolving and questioning. So there is this innate curiosity with children about, and they are molded by their surroundings and they are mirroring their parents or their, the family, whoever it is that is raising them, they are, they are molding to their environment. And as those children, as we continue to grow, we begin to develop our own beliefs, our own values. We kind of begin breaking off and acting in different ways than maybe we had seen as, as children. And not everybody was raised in a religious or spiritual household. I love that there's a phrase in unity that says that we, we honor, here at unity, we honor all, all faith traditions and paths usually except for the one that we grew up in. So I grew up with a, uh, with a religious tradition upbringing. And later on in life, then I developed, uh, I, I came into unity, I actually came into unity 10 years ago. And it was very interesting to me to have grown up in a religious tradition that was very um, confiding, that was very restricting, that was kind of, here's the book, here's a tutorial of who God is. Okay, now go go live life. And there really wasn't space for me to be able to ask questions and, and explore. So when I came into Unity, I remember feeling very guarded because the, the new thought, the Unity movement was so much more broad than, than I knew. I had always, I had always lived life on a, um, in a bowling alley with the bumpers on, you know, this is just where you stay in unity, just open wide. 
the doors of, of healing and learning and a, a deeper spiritual path and a deeper understanding as to why we're here. And it, it really scared me at first. But over the course of the last 10 years, I have just watched these teachings continue to transform my life and to transform the lives of others who are in this. And so I'm delighted that we are all on this journey together, that we have all said yes to whatever it is that is knocking for us, that is calling us deeper. So when we incorporate uh, a spiritual journey, we grow into these higher versions of ourselves. And I'm not talking about uh, narcissism. I'm not talking about egotism. I'm just talking about growing into, again, that core, that, that truth of who we are. All growth first takes place in mind and then ripples out in action. And we experience that in the law of mind action, one of the principles of Unity's teachings that says our thoughts help to create and to shape our reality. Therefore, we are encouraged to stay mindful of the actions that uh, we take, the opportunities, the things that we attract. So we focus on positive thinking. We focus on uh, awareness and affirmations because every experience is a stepping stone to spiritual growth and understanding. The second point I want to make is that challenging opportunities push us to expand our consciousness to develop resilience and to deepen our faith. I can't help as I was, I was putting this talk together to think of Unity co-founder Myrtle Fillmore, also known as the, the mother of Unity. She, and, uh, she had quite the healing story. She was later on in life afflicted with tuberculosis and it just ravaged her body. And she was very, very sick and she thought this is, this is the end. This is just my story is that it is, it is a, about being sick, having sickness. And so she attended a lecture in 1886 by metaphysician, um, Dr. E.B. Weeks. And so she came to this lecture and she sat and she listened. And there was one statement that he made that profoundly changed her life. And that statement was, I am a child of God. Therefore, I don't inherit sickness. And that really struck her. She hadn't heard a statement like that before, but she left that lecture with that, that affirmation. I am a child of God. Therefore, I don't inherit sickness. And she took it to prayer and she took it to meditation and she used repetition with it. And she began to see her life, her body being transformed, healing itself. And her husband, also Unity co-founder, Charles Fillmore, was witnessing what was taking place in her life and began applying those same teachings, those same, that same practice as he had his own health challenges. And they both began to their healing journey. And Myrtle Fillmore did fully uh, heal herself. She recovered from tuberculosis and lived, lived on into her 90s. So we all have our stories. We all have our stories of healing. We all have those opportunities that come in that can drive us toward God or away from God. And when I use the name God, if that is is uh, makes you a bit jumpy, I know we just talked a little bit earlier about kind of the cats that get on their back legs and they it just if it just makes you squirm, it's okay. Call it universe. Call it. Uh, any any name that you have for God, spirit, source, life, love, whatever that may be, you're welcome to substitute that. But we all have those stories within our life that drive us toward that greater good or drive us away. I also think of Job in the uh, Hebrew scriptures in the Christian Bible that he has this life where he just has everything. He is wealthy beyond imagine. And it's not only uh, monetary wealth, but he has a huge family with lots of children. He has livestock, he has property, he has homes, he has servants, he has just everything that he can imagine. Until one night when all of that changed, 
And the story goes in the scriptures that there is a servant that comes running into him one, one night, comes into his home and says, there has been a terrible, terrible thing that has happened. A gang has come and has wiped out your livestock and has wiped out your, your land. There are no more crops. I am the only surviving one here to tell this message to you. And then in comes another servant from another area saying, there has been a terrible thing that has happened tonight. A gang has come in and has killed all of your servants. I am the only one from this group surviving. And I've come here to tell you that. And then the perhaps the worst one of all comes in. A, a third servant comes in and says, I was just with your family and there was a terrible storm. It collapsed your house and it killed all of your children. And it says in that, in that moment that Job tore at his clothing and ripped it off and shaved his head because of the amount of grief that he felt and he experienced. But there was one thing that Job did not let go of, and that was his faith. That no matter what opportunity was coming at him, no matter what um, terror and heartache, he stayed faithful in his faith and believing that there was something greater that was coming from this. And it goes on in the story to then say that Job was richly rewarded for his faithfulness, for his perseverance and his dedication. And although he didn't have his actual children back, he began having the new experience of this returning, this restoration that was taking place. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I can't catch a break. How many of you have felt like Job or you, it's just been one thing after another and you're going, okay, universe, you got me. What's, what's up? What, what is going on here? So who do we turn to or what do we turn to? Are we taking the these opportunities to go within to practice what we teach here in unity, seeking divine guidance? We are we focusing on that Christ nature that is within each and every one of us. I also think too about the the life of Jesus, where there were um, Jesus didn't seek answers outside of himself. It is said that he was the first one to fully realize his divine nature, that he is both human and divine, and to fully live that out. And there are countless times in scripture where it says Jesus went away. Jesus went away from the crowds, away from the people, away from the noise, and people still pursued him. This morning, I was thinking about the about the visual of a parent who tries to go into the restroom for a few minutes of silence. And there's that little hand under the door with the little fingers that come out like, hi, I know you're in there. I can imagine that's probably how Jesus felt. I'm just, I just, I need some space. I need a break. But it, it says that he went away and he turned within to speak, to, to connect to God. And that was in preparation for anything that they're, um, Anything that was heavy, when there was grief, when he was overwhelmed, when he needed to make an important decision, whatever those circumstances are, Jesus went away and he went within. And so what a beautiful example he provides in our lives of remembering that the answers are not outside of us. The answers are already within each and every one of us. And so he, so he sought solitude. Not isolation, but solitude to get into that deeper space. In life, I think that I, I remember going through, I would say about pre-K to, uh, to high school. And then I went on to college and got my degree. And then I went on to ministerial school, got my master's degree. I don't ever remember enrolling in the School of Hard Knocks. And that has happened again and again. I'm thinking, where can I drop out? Where can I unsubscribe from this and drop out of that program? If it, everything that we have, everything that we experience, it's there to teach us something. So how do we react to that? Do we turn from 
whatever's behind that door, or do we lean into it with curiosity? Every experience that we have is a stepping stone to spiritual growth and understanding. And the third thing I want to say is that our experiences not only are valuable for our own growth, but it also serves as vital contributions to the collective journey of humanity. We may feel that we are alone in our circumstances, but the realization is that we are all on our own unique spiritual journeys. We are all seeking similar things. It's just the packaging may look different. So I want you to think of a hero in your life. Think of someone who has inspired you, influenced you, helped shape you. They could be a family member. They could be a minister or somebody in the, in the unity movement. And I would love to hear if, uh, if a few people wouldn't mind unmuting, just speak out a few words of what your hero, what that person represents to you. I would love to, to hear from anybody. Or humility. You can... humility, humility, humility. Yes, Dennis, humility. How about strength? Resilience. Creativity. Creativity. That's a great one, Jeff. Integrity. Mm, yes, Terry, integrity. Authenticity. Gentleness. We had a couple. Go ahead. Gentleness. Gentleness. Yes. Empowerment. Empowerment. So every... Compassion. Compassion. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so Radiance. every of the, oh, I'm sorry. I cut. I cut somebody off. No, was Radiance. It Radiance. Radiance. I love that. So every word that has been spoken here, just now, and every word that is in our mind that we think of those people, is in you. Is in each and every one of you, that we have those qualities that are, we are reflecting those out and we're seeing that in certain in certain people. So we are surrounded by teachers. We are surrounded by people that we want to be like. And we're surrounded pe by people and teachers that remind us what we don't want to be like in this world. So can we have that compassion? Can we be able to extend that to recognize that everybody in our life is a teacher? And therefore, it is important for us to be able to work on ourselves because it does have that outward impact. I am a member of both Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and I have well earned my seats in the recovery community. And when there are newcomers that are coming in, whether they be for the first time they're coming into recovery or whether they're coming back from a relapse, they're coming into this shared room and looking around at the people that are in this room and look at the old timers, as we call them. Those are usually those with double digits of sobriety and many, 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 many years. They newcomers come in and they look at the old timers and think, I want what they have. Whatever it is that they're doing, there is something there that is working for them. There is a freedom that they are able to get out of their addiction and into stability. And I want that. Then you have those that are the old timers and everybody else in between who looks at the newcomer and is reminded of how life used to be and what happens if there is a relapse or if, if, if you stop showing up, that this is the reality and the risk that is, that is inevitable for those who are in addiction and recovery. But they look at the newcomers and they say, thank you. 
for your story because your story matters. So each and every person in here, regardless of where they are on their journey, regardless of whether you're in a recovery community for recovering from anything, a lot of us are just trying to recover from life right now, <laughs> navigating that. So whatever that may be, we can always learn from others that are around us. So that can be a challenge as is. But I, I, if you would like a further challenge, I would like to invite you to surround yourself with people who don't look like you, with people who don't think like you or believe like you. Okay, I want everyone to take a breath real quick. Just surround yourself with people who don't vote like you. I told you this is this is master level. <laughs> I am often not there. But when you surround yourself with those who see the world differently, who look different, who show up different, they are there to teach you more about who you are, more about who your higher power, who your God, who, who made you. They are there to teach you and to show you every experience is a stepping stone to stepping stone to spiritual growth and understanding. Ram Das has a beautiful one sentence statement that I love, and it's he says, "We are all just walking each other home." Isn't that beautiful? We are all just walking each other home. He also says it is important to expect nothing to take every experience, including the negative ones, as merely steps on the path and to proceed. Life will life. People will people. And opportunities will continue to come and go. So will you seek community or isolation? Will you seek authenticity? Will you be steadfast in the spiritual practices and the teachings of this great movement that we are all in that calls us to turn within, to dig deep, and to be these expressions of love and light in the world? Who's there? Namaste. Wow. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Uh, I have put myself into uh, situations where you, you talked about where uh, no one thinks like me, looks like me, votes like me. And uh, it's a, a huge eye opener. That's for sure shifts your paradigm. <laughs> well, so thank you very much.